Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the closing keynote of our Library 2.021 mini conference, Reinventing Libraries for a Post-COVID World. We're so thrilled for what a fun day this has been. Our closing keynote speaker is Chris Jacobs. We're virtually there, how COVID speaks to the future of community. Special thanks to San Jose State University School of Information for their support for this conference over, over a decade. Dr. Sandra Hirsch, are you here? Would you like to say a few quick words? Yes, I am. Thank you. And um, I just want to thank again, um, Alyssa for her fantastic uh, work in helping to put this amazing mini conference together. It has been our pleasure sponsoring this and we're very excited about our closing keynote. Um, I hope everybody has uh, learned some useful things that they can um, uh, will help them in navigating in this post COVID world. And again, we're just pleased to uh, be part, uh, sponsoring this important event at the School of Information at San Jose State University. So thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hirsch. Chris, welcome back. You're, you're All right. you I knew it. I knew it. I was just finding the button. I was responding to uh, a chat request. Um, thank you, everybody. And I do want to echo uh, Dr. Hirsch in thanking Steve and Alyssa for um, welcoming me to this event. I definitely um, uh, appreciate the sort of uh, the ability to have this platform with um, some of you today. And I do want to say uh, Steve has given me the flexibility to kind of run this uh, perhaps in an atypical fashion. And I do want to say that if you guys have questions or uh, things that you want to chat about, I may not have a full half hour of just keynote, keynote, keynote. Um, so I will just uh, say if there are things that you want to know, uh, let about the things that I've done or the things that I'm talking about are just discussion points, um, pop them into the chat. Now I say that and I recognize that I already sound like an influencer online. Pop them into the chat, folks. Um, but that's my personality. It's something that I've gleaned over the course of uh, the years that I've been a teacher. And I actually um, sort of want to start out by that, not only because it's an inside joke on our streams, I constantly talk about how I used to be a high school English teacher, but it is maybe an important um, thing um, for those of you who might not have um, heard my intro in the opening panel. Um, it is, I think, an, at least I've been told, from what I've been told, <clears throat> um, it is an important aspect of sort of my professional identity in coming and speaking before you guys uh, today. I was a high school English teacher for several years. It was a career change that I explored um, in my very early 30s after a few years in the for-profit education field. But the thing that you should <clears throat> understand about me is that I've always wanted to work with youth. I've always specifically um, centered um, my professional career or my professional work around teenagers. Um, I like to think of myself in some ways as sort of like a, t like a teenager at heart, um, very much echoing the, you know, I'm a Toys R Us kid, I don't want to grow up. Um, but in many ways, I recognize that kind of affinity um, for teenagerhood as uh, something that I analogize to something that I uh, wrote in grad school for education um, when I went, which was this idea that um, I believe the true function of education is to create sort of lifelong learners. Um, this idea that, um, you know, we are always in the process of discovery, that includes discovery about the world, self-discovery, all of these things. And I know that that sounds very quaint and or, you know, pretentious, but um, it's actually something that I've seen echoed uh, in my library system. I've heard, I mean, I love the alliteration as a former English teacher of uh, the, the concept of lifelong learner, but I also uh, just love the idea that libraries serve as sort of these bastions of, or these pillars of um, lifelong learning, right? It's sort of, they're non, they're, you know, very much non-age specific, right? Everybody belongs in the context of uh, Boston Public Library's motto, you know, we are free to all. And it's that inclusivity piece that I, you know, absolutely jive with and, you know, feel echoes of my experience in education within. Um, but I don't want to get lost in that. I want to talk a little bit about an anecdote. So the title of the conference is, uh, or the conference, the conference, the title of my keynote is We're Virtually There. Um, uh, oh, used to be your library's motto. Excellent. Um, 
the idea, we're virtually there, um, the nature of community. I forget the exact name of it, but I'm gonna be exploring a little bit about this concept of community because I think it's relevant um, to conversations that I've been having both at my library, but also um, some of the discussions that are sort of happening around this concept of virtual programming and the future of library systems. And I'll start with an anecdote um, with a library from Boston Public Library, um, a librarian, excuse me, from Boston Public Library who shall remain nameless um, because I certainly don't want um, the uh, thing that I'll share that she said to me to come off as, um, you know, uh, I, I want to say um, regressive or anything like that, but I was having a conversation with this librarian um, who I very much respect and very much kind of took me under her wing to kind of teach me the, the pillars of librarianship. And at one point um, we're talking about um, sort of like, uh, you know, where we're going with programming. And I had already started to dip my toes into this realm of virtual programming and we were talking about, I think, perhaps getting other other librarians involved, and she was expressing how a lot of librarians in our system might have resistance to this concept because, and I'm probably not directly paraphrasing her here, but um, she said something along the lines of, you know, what is a library without a library? <laughs> um, you know, hearkening back to, you know, the earliest days of my understanding of what libraries were, is that they were sort of this physical space first. Um, and, you know, they were the people inside and the thoughts and ideas generated second. Um, and I think that, you know, as, you know, people who are in and around libraries, and obviously I've had, you know, a, a hell of an education um, in the past year and a half with the library system here in Boston on how libraries um, sort of are so much more than that um, for, you know, I could expound on that for a lot, but I'm not for a long time, but I'm not going to because you all know um, that's part of why you're here. It's because you're so much more than that. But I do think that um, I'm, my guess would be, because it certainly crossed my mind very early on in the pandemic, you know, what there, that there's this resistance to thinking that we are as much as we are um, as <clears throat> librarians or library workers, um, for those of you who don't consider yourselves librarians per se, um, without the physical space as we are with the physical space. And it's not to say that the physical space does not have this in, intrinsic value to it, but that we are just as much a library without it as we are with it. And this sort of pertains to kind of the nature of geography and how places, right, sort of pertain to purpose and belonging. And this concept of a community that we root in geography, right? When we say, you know, um, serving a community, um, oftentimes that community can be geolocated, right? Or, or geofenced into a specific region. Um, and serving the community is like what my whole life's work has all been about. Even when I worked for the poor for-profit sector, I mean, don't tell them I said this, but it's been a long time. Um, I was always looking for ways to provide the best level of service to those who had the least. So this concept of serving the community in public service particularly has always appealed to me professionally. And I would um, not hesitate to maybe positively presume that many who are in attendance today feel the same way and feel passionately about that concept. Um, and I remember when I became a teacher, so um, I originally, well, I, I consistently throughout my career in teaching, I was, um, I, I became a teacher in a community where I didn't live. And, you know, I thought of teaching and I still kind of think of teaching as uh, an ultimate means of serving people who need support, who need knowledge. Um, and of course, as I say that, I feel like that's very librarian as well. Um, you know, skills, all that good stuff. But I remember feeling a certain sense of estrangement, if you will, um, that there was a focus on community building um, at the schools where I taught that I couldn't participate as well in or as robustly like within because I was not a member of the geographic community. I would be, um, so I taught in, in Medway, which is sort of a um, 
middle Massachusetts suburb, um, uh, you know, probably 40, 45 minute drive from where I lived. And again, to some of you, that might be, feel like a lot, to others, it might feel like nothing, but there were a uh, preponderance of teachers at that, in that school system that actually lived in Medway. And it was sort of a, um, it was sort of a goal to sort of, um, for most of the, uh, public school teachers to eventually bring themselves closer, not only for convenience, but also for this feeling of closeness and connection with the community. And I always felt, like I said, the sense of estrangement that the physical distance um, from the towns, you know, and, and it did make it more difficult to participate in like, there's a game this, you know, uh, this weekend where there's a play this evening. You know, for me, that required me staying all afternoon in that community and then being you know, there for the evening. And I did do that because I was very devoted. I'm, sh I'm hoping that my energy kind of conveys the sense of devotion to you guys, and I'm not just blowing smoke here, but the idea um, that I still felt that feeling of belonging sort of like el elusive because I, I wasn't geographically there. Um, and then, you know, when I get down on myself because of that, I think, well, like, actually, that's not the only definition of community uh, that I ascribe to. And certainly as an English teacher, I'm all about, uh, you know, the vague amorphous definitions. I'm a former English teacher, I should say. Um, the, the community felt exclusionary to me in that context in that geographical context, but in another context entirely was really a pillar of my own identity. And although I don't go around uh, starting sentences like this, I could start a sentence um, haughtily with, as a member of the queer community, um, and as I've come to understand, you know, um, a lot of um, you know, members of the queer community who are librarians, you know, very much understand uh, their um, belonging to that community as something central to their identities, both uh, personal and maybe professional in certain contexts. And for me, it certainly is, and I can only really speak to my experience, but when you think about the concept of a queer community, um, we're really talking about a community that's not geographic in nature. Um, and we're talking about a sense of community that is very different from the sense of, you know, even, even when we were looking at, um, you know, serving the community. Um, uh, it's very rare that we would be referring to a non-geographic community when we're talking about serving a community. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I sort of thought about them as, as two different things. And I'll get to the point here. Uh, this idea that, um, you know, there's this word again, community that was being used in the sense that like transcended the coincidence of geography. Um, it spoke to something really deep and, you know, irrevocable, irrevocable about me. It granted me this like sense of belonging that like could not be removed from me. Um, but that was also a community. Um, and I'll go from that sort of dichotomy, right? Although I'm sure there's an overlap there somewhere into a concept that probably is going to be more controversial, especially to those of you guys who know, um, you know, what uh, I've been doing virtually for the past few months well, um, which is um, streaming uh, often gaming, gaming content, uh, but often um, non-gaming content on a Boston Public Library Twitch channel. And Twitch, for those of you guys who don't know, is, um, or you know, might have only a kind of like nominal knowledge is an online streaming platform, not too unlike uh, Facebook Live or uh, YouTube streaming um, that allows you to essentially stream content from your own device, uh, audiovisual content of almost any sort within reason, but often of a gaming variety out to um, presumably willing users or viewers as uh, Twitch likes to call it. And uh, the controversy here is that actually when I was doing, so I've done a lot of work uh, on Twitch, of course, we've done over, I think, 150 individual programs on Twitch. Um, and a lot of those, you know, before anybody gets too impressed, a lot of those are the same game being played with our viewers, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't wanna sound like it's this highfalutin thing. Um, but at the same time, we've done a lot of, uh, of programs there. And um, as a result, I've gotten some attention and spoken at a few conferences. I wrote an article that was recently published in the latest YALS um, on how we set things up. Um, and I won't bore you with all of that uh, stuff, but 
although some of it's very interesting and I would recommend um, reading that article. Uh, I re upon researching like how Twitch refers to its own viewership, um, uh, it also uses this term community. And thank you, Andrea. Uh, I really appreciate the shout out to the link uh, to our Twitch channel. Um, but it also uses this term community to describe particularly, I think, the relationship between a streamer or a host, however you want to call it, a channel owner, and their viewers. And I found that really interesting because, <laughs> for lack of a better term, uh, that verbiage may, may felt more slimy in this context. It felt uh, very marketing, very deceptive, and very exploitative, and not to turn anybody away from Twitch too hard, but it is an Amazon-owned for-profit streaming service that has its own opt-in but built-in economy. Now, before any of you guys get too up in arms, the Boston Public Library Twitch channel does not uh, subscribe per se to any of the paid um, options in Twitch. Our Twitch is much like our library, free to all. Um, and you know we are going to keep it that way as we continue to grow to the absolute best of our ability. And if Twitch ever removes our ability to do that, we'll have a different conversation with them. But this concept, right, of um, you know even some of my friends that streamed on Twitch, they would talk about their communities and it felt wrong. It felt um, incorrect to take um, a group of viewers, people, individuals that you know could be paying for services um, or paying for viewership of something and calling them a community. Now, again, our teens um, were not ever and nor will they be ever paying for anything. But even then, right, calling them a community um, didn't feel exactly right until I thought about it more and I reminded myself just how many of them popped up again and again and again in our programs. We've been seeing some of the same faces for 12 months. Um, we've gotten to know these kids, certainly not in a physical context, but we understand a lot about their identities, their affinities. Um, in so many ways, it was actually funny. We tried to set up um, an analogous sort of social um, sort of affinity group network called Discord um, that didn't end up panning out for a variety of reasons. Um, and we called that the virtual teen room, but in many ways, right, the community of viewers that we ended up seeing and talking with and interacting with on Twitch, uh, particularly, I think, because I hosted a lot of those, that content myself, calling it a community when I'm doing it doesn't feel slimy, it doesn't feel marketing, and it doesn't feel deceptive. So in many ways, maybe like Amazon has me under their spell, but I don't really think that that's it. I think that what it is, is that I've come to realize that if you get people together under the guise of some form of inherent commonality, right, then you have yourself a community. And again, you know, it speaks to it speaks to a sense of community that is more along the line of the second thing I described, this concept of a queer community versus a, um, you know, a Boston community or a Medway community. Now, I think that the idea here is that, you know, when we define community, the first thing that oftentimes we think of is that geographic sense. When we really look at the way that community is built, it does not require geography. And the reason that I'm talking about this is not to try to say, oh, and now is my pitch for why all libraries should go virtual all the time. Um, we recently opened back up our teen room and we're so delighted at that physical space and just to be able to touch and then disinfect you know, all of our surroundings is, you know, there's this energy and excitement about that um, that I think it's, is really important. Um, but there's a temptation that comes alongside that, that I feel like some of you guys in the audience might be experiencing um, right now 
if, if um, you are in the process or the midst of reopening or if reopening has already happened or if you've been back in that physical space and you're allowing patrons to come back, which is to say that if you had been doing virtual programming, right, um, in the past that, you know, now that the library is back, the library is the library again, and you can library in the library again. And the community, as we perhaps came to define it, when many of us first became librarians, which was rooted not in affinity, not in commonality, but perhaps more so, maybe not entirely not in those things, but perhaps more so in geography, in the people who come through the doors, right? that that definition, right, is tempting to subsume the other, particularly those of us who have cultivated, right, online or virtual communities in the interim. Um, it's much easier to serve, right, um, you know, I want to say it's easier, uh, maybe it's easier for some of you guys vert to go virtually. I think easier is maybe a, a mistake to say, but it's perhaps for many of us, perhaps, perhaps those of us who've been librarians for a longer time, um, and I'll say even for myself, it's, it is much easier to, to you know, serve the public when they're in front of you as opposed to behind a microphone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and perhaps easier isn't the right word, but it's more comfortable. It feels more correct. Um, you know, it feels, um, you know, certainly um, more, under our control for anybody who has suffered under a poor internet connection or struggles with finding uh, viewers um, where they are in terms of, um, you know, I just remember, um, I think Lorraine was talking about parking lots full of people struggling to get Wi-Fi and it's sort of a heartbreaking image in my head. And I know that they were the same in, in Boston. You know, it's, there are all sorts of added issues, right, when we think about virtual communities. Um, and in fact, many of us, I, I would argue, um, you know, even my own colleagues would rather never think about them again, <laughs> because of all the frustrations and perhaps um, this sort of judgment that, you know, these communities are not real, they're not substantive. Um, and I do want to make sure that I don't necessarily say that community from a geographic perspective does not have value because it absolutely does. I am a member of the Boston Public Library System and I want to serve that community first. I also, as a member of the Central Library, serve the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I perhaps serve that community second. But I would also make an argument that there are members of that geographic community who would be members of your virtual community and perhaps may never um, choose to, if they, if they don't have to, set foot in the physical library space. And of course, you know, we don't necessarily know um, who those individuals are. I know some of them because I have been, you know, uh, playing games with them for a little while. But I want to go back to this side of some temptation that I was talking about that uh, we want to go back to the way things were, the way we were comfortable before. I mean, frankly, we've all, um, you know, made it through to the other side of a catastrophic event in many ways. Um, and now is the time for, you know, healing and returning to form. I understand and I get all of that. That being said, that temptation sort of comes uh, and, the, and the, the threat of that temptation is we lose the things that we've gained in the interim. And I think that um, by virtue of what you've understood in this, um, in this mini conference, that those things that we have gained are many, and they are not so much sort of, um, some of them are sort of concrete skills, but some of them are more thought processes, perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we, for lack of a better term, I think that we kind of understand um, our, all right, let me take a, take a step back for just a moment. I think that when we think about libraries, right, um, we want to be providing services and we want to be here for people and the library being open and ready for the public is a measure of that 
existence is, is an important measure of that existence. People absolutely need a place to go and to be sometimes. And I am not in advocating for the maintenance of virtual, advocating for the movement away from uh, physical. I think that there could be a best of both worlds, an idea that sort of is predicated on this notion that we can be here, right, physical, but we can also be now, which I believe is virtual. And let me explain that a little bit. This idea that all of these skills and all of these things that um, you know have been introduced, Zoom calling, video conferencing, and that have been that have sort of blown up. Those technologies are, if I were a betting person, and I kind of am, at least in video games, they're not going away, okay? They may be less apparent in our daily professional lives, but they're not going away. And what I can certainly assure you is that for the youth, they are not going away. They are going um, to be a more robust part of their culture, of their you know, waking lives, their professional lives, et cetera, et cetera. And that part of our responsibility as a library system is to not only be here, but also to be now, to meet the future citizens of the world, of our communities, geographic or more conceptual, where they are, right? And they are operating virtually. They are creating and trying on virtual hats as a means to fi figure out their identities. There is so much psycho psychology going into talking about online spaces and how um, they can suppress or you know, uh, support identity exploration, things of that nature. And I know I come at it from this sort of youth angle, but for those of us who plan careers, um, you know, into the 2030s, the 2040s, I think that there is an impetus to uh, keep our eyes focused on that now. And as painful as it might be to acknowledge that the now is as important as the here. I hope this metaphor is landing um, for some of you, this idea that like there's a physical library space, there is also a technological or a virtual library space. And we are perhaps best suited to try to be responsible for both at the same time, rather than um, returning to one because the other one is no longer needed. And I think that, um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of speak to, um, I'll pay homage really to Kelly Williams because I attended her event, which was about sort of making an argument for virtual. And uh, I haven't spent a lot of time doing that and I didn't have a lot of time for the chat, but um, that something that I think that I've absorbed from this whole um, rigmarole for lack of a better term is that I now, going back to that conversation that I had with um, this other librarian, you know, what is a library out without a library? And I've come to understand that a library is, and this is going to seem succinct and perhaps oversimplified, the library is less a community space than it is a community force. And the sooner that we understand that our services and how we can benefit the community um, does not solely rely on the resources that we have in the space, I think um, it will awaken us to maybe, and again, for lack of a better term, what the library 2.0 is. So on that note, I think I'll point to Steve coming back online. Um, hopefully I haven't bored you all um, with some of my anecdotes, but, and, and philosophy here. Um, for any of you who are interested in hearing more about um, sort of the Twitch programming that we've done or any of the functional uh, aspects of that, you can definitely reach out to me. I'll type my, um, my Twitch email in the chat, which is virtualteenroom at uh, bpl.org. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, others. <laughs> All right, I landed it. Thank you, Britt. <laughs> this feels very Twitch right now, reacting to the chat. So this is this is my uh, this is my safe zone. I like this. <laughs> nice job, Chris. For Thanks. those of you who are sort of thinking about this, our fall event, Library 2.0 Mini Conference, is on libraries as community anchors. 
So uh, I think this is going to play really well. A good and, segue. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Thanks to you, Chris, for wrapping us up. Thanks to everybody who's participated today. It's been a wonderful day. Really appreciate it. Hope you all have a great weekend. The recordings will get posted next week. Just go to library20.com and they are available for free. Thanks and take care. Oh, I think they're asking for my contact and panelist only, and I think I need to send it to all attendees. So I'll go ahead and do that. Sure. Okay, we'll post the chat as well. So don't worry if you <laughs> missed it. It'll all get posted next week. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye guys. Now.